Okay, hi, welcome. Hey, Norwegians. <laughs> hi, welcome. Hey. <laughs> okay, um, how many of you know the TV show The Long Way Round? Wow, almost no one. <laughs> I thought that's a brilliant uh, joke. Um, <laughs> so it's basically um, about two guys. One of them is Ewan McGregor, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, <laughs> and they take the bicycle from London to Los Angeles, but they're going eastwards. Okay, so they're choosing the longest possible route they could find to get to their goal. And when you look at OAuth and this thing called proof of possession tokens, it feels exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so proof of possession is a security feature of OAuth, and if you don't know what it means, don't worry, we're going to explain it. And if you know what it means, you probably know, oh, that's kind of complicated. <laughs> and, um, and it took almost 10 years, right? I mean, OAuth was 2011-ish or something, and... Uh, and now, 10 years later, did we finally have a workable solution to this thing called proof possession tokens, uh, which you know closes a gap, I think, in the whole security model of OAuth. Okay, so that's kind of like um, the the topic. <laughs> um, so I'm here with my good friend Steiner. Um, Hello. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we work together um, on on that and and other things. Um, and many of that is directly related, so if you're from Norway, to, you know, to, to how things work in Norway. Um, actually, by the way, uh, the most important link here is the link to the slides, so, you know, um, all the slides are uploaded already, so, you know, no need to take pictures all the time of the, of the slides, um, they're all there for you, um, and you can um, um, download them, okay? So, yeah, so I'm basically... Uh, it feels like for, since my whole life I'm talking about this, kind of. Um, but uh, the last 15 years or so I've been working on OAuth and OpenID Connect and, uh, you know, wrote a token server or free or maybe more. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like a near and dear to my heart topic. And who are you, Steiner? Yeah, hi, <laughs> I'm Steiner. I hope none of you uh, thought that the topic was about concealing uh, hidden drugs. That could also be a sort of interpretation. So uh, anyway, I'm Stan Light. I, I've, um, I used to be a developer, so I uh, don't do a lot of development anymore, but I work with the health sector, and I've been doing that for many years now. Uh, so the reason why we are talking about OAuth in the health sector is because um, they are actually modernizing a lot of the technology, uh, and they are starting to use... Uh, new modern uh, or semi-modern uh, ways of authentication and securing services. So, uh, yeah, so the, the reason we met is basically because of this big project you're doing in Norway about uh, kind of modernizing the health sector, right? And, yes. and part of that is moving to OAuth and OpenID Connect and, and all of these technologies. Um, and, you know, like when OAuth was designed 10 years ago or so, Probably they didn't anticipate that it became so p would, would become so popular, <laughs> right? So the, 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 the original use case of like, you know, like the, the classic canonical use case of how can you connect a third party to your Google Calendar kind of thing, yeah, was nice, but now it's used in healthcare, in banking, in the military, <laughs> and basically everywhere, right? And um, so there's this movement towards a higher security OAuth version, so to speak. So, so you have the base RFCs and then uh, lots of stuff layers on top of that. And there are multiple uh, independent initiatives worldwide that try to create a more secure profile for OAuth, right? And some of them you can see here. PSD2 is at the, per the Payment Service Directive 2, which is a, you know, like a banking thing. Um, FAPI, which stands for Financial APIs, or they later renamed it to Financial Grade APIs, yeah, something that needs as much security as the finance industry, so to speak. Um, in, in the States, there, there's stuff going on about uh, enterprise profiles of OAuth, and one of the missing pieces was always... Proof of position. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we are here. Yes. Okay? So, um, yeah, so just a quick agenda, so you can still leave the room if you think oh, that's boring or something. Um, we want to quickly talk about the status quo, which is bearer tokens in OAuth, and what are they missing, and what are proof of possession tokens in, in, in contrast. Give you some history, 
reasons why stuff is happening now, right? And then we're going to talk about the two technologies that you could use today to, to implement this feature. Okay? So, who is using OAuth? Everyone does, exactly, right? And that's how it works, right? Uh, you get a token from an OAuth authorization server, and then you send the token to the API to call the API. Easy. <laughs> and that was exactly the, the design goal of OAuth, to make it as easy as possible, right? Um, but there's this little thing here called bearer tokens, yeah? And what bearer tokens means is, is that whoever owns the token can call the API. So, in other words, the only thing that you need to call the API is, um, is having that token, right? Um, again, it works, right? Um, but it kind of assumes um, an ideal world. It assumes that every single piece in that OAuth conversation is perfectly secure, right? The authorization server does not leak the token, the client does not leak the token, the transport is perfectly secure from eavesdropping, man-in-the-middle attacks, uh, you are not, as I said, leaking tokens into log files or URLs or, you know, because anyone who could access that could take the token and call the API and Im impersonate the client, right? Um, or even, uh, if, if, if you never thought about this, what about the API? The API even, you know, like you, you're sending the token to the API, the API could take the token, turn around and call another API using the token, mm -hmm. right? Because all it needs is the being the bearer of the token. That's where the name comes from, yeah? Um, and that seems a little bit risky, <laughs> yeah? So um, who has done W security? <laughs> yeah? Um, I did, right? And uh, a, a lot of it, and uh, <laughs> I actually could even remember how it worked while writing the talk. Um, and that, that, that's from 2004. That, that's kind of like before the OAuth wave, right? Mm -hmm. And if you read those specifications, I mean, that was serious enterprise stuff, right? IBM, Microsoft, Sun, VeriSign. I mean, th that, these specs were no place for humor. I can tell you, yeah? <laughs> no jokes in those specs, yeah? Um, and they's, their job was to write specs to, to secure the enterprise, right? And right from the start, they assume the enterprise needs a lot of security. And also, seeing that it's from 2004, uh, imagine 2004, TLS was not widely deployed, right? Especially not in the enterprise, <laughs> yeah? So, yeah, so the, the, their mission was to, to create something secure. So just to give you a quick rundown um, of how double, uh, proof possession worked in W security. Oh, yeah, and I forgot maybe to define the term proof possession. Basically, what they mean with proof of possession is, is that unlike a bearer token, only the client that requested the token in the first place can actually use the token. Okay? So, in the proof of possession scenario, if, if an attacker would get the token from the wire or from a log file, they would not be able to use that token. So, how does it work? Yeah? Um, and you will see that there's a common pattern here, regardless of which technology we're looking at. They almost look similar, yeah, but um, a little bit different. <laughs> so, um, in W security, and that is 15, 20 years ago, okay, almost. Um, the way this worked is the client generated a secret, okay, uh, a key, okay, and then the client uh, made a W's trust request, if you remember W's trust, yeah, the good stuff, um, to the STS and encrypted that secret with the public key of the STS. So, so now, even if you could read the wire, you could not see the secret because it was encrypted with the public key of the STS. Now, what the STS did then is it responded with a SAML token, and that SAML token contained the secret that got sent by the client. Of course, you cannot just send the SAML token over the wire now because the wire is insecure by definition, so the SAML token needs to be encrypted with the public key of the XML web service. Yeah? Okay, cool. And then the last thing would be that the client is now calling the service, sends along the encrypted SAML token, and signs the XML envelope, or body, or parts of it, or you know, there are many variations, with the secret. Okay? So now the service is, is expected to decrypt the SAML token, get the secret out of the SAML token, and then validate the signature of the XML envelope. And only if they match up, 
the client has proven that it's the same client that asked for the token in the first place. Right? Now, what was the big problem here with this uh, approach? Cryptography. Right? Because the client needed to know upfront the public key of the STS. The STS needed to know upfront the public key of the XML web service. Right? The whole key management became a nightmare. Yeah? And now throw in key rotation. Have you ever seen key rotation in the wild? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> There's a reason for that, because it's hard. Okay? So now imagine everyone here would, would, would rotate keys every 10 days. Right? Uh, all, all of that overhead. So this uh, wild, this, so did, did anyone do WCF? Poor souls? Yeah? You had like a long config file with tons of public keys in there, right? And they, they were not just regular public keys, they were X, X509 certificates, of course, because that was the thing by the time, right? So you had, you had to throw in a PKI and, you know, some other stuff. Okay, cool. So, so that's how it works. And, uh, you know, in, in theory, that did work, yeah? Um, but still, this, this was going over plain text HTTP, right? So lots of opportunity to mess around with packages and replace signatures and blah. So, so they created another spec on top of that called WS Secure Conversation to make it even more complicated, which basically meant that, that there was a negotiation phase in the beginning where they created a session key and... Uh, anyways, <laughs> you know, it, it, it did work if you could guarantee that the client stack and the server stack are the same, like WCF, for example, but that, that was far from being interoperable, of course. Okay, so then came OAuth. What about OAuth? Um, actually, OAuth 1.0 had the very best intentions. Uh, the guy who wrote the spec, Aaron Hammer, he um, looked at WS security, he hated WS security. Uh, there, there were some interviews where he often says, like, the spec is as bad as WS security. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, but, so, so he hated XML, he hated SOAP, he hated all of that stuff, but he liked the idea of binding the token to the client. So there he made uh, signature-bound tokens that default and pretty much the only option in O of 1.0. Yeah? Now, if you look at the spec, uh, for OAuth of 1.0, here's the section 3.4, signatures, okay? And it, it talks about how, how, to, how to create a signature. First, you need to create a string, then you need to normalize that string. It looks a little bit like this, and then you need to create a base URI. You need to canonicalize that URI. You need to put in the parameters and the query strings. You sort them by alphabet and, <laughs> and so on. And 10 pages later, you end up with this, Okay, um, and five pages later you end up with that, and then you have to do it for every single API call. Okay, so while this was possible, with you know, um, it was complicated. Yeah. Um, so when um, O of two got became a thing, right? So O of one became popular, but many people said. The signature part is too hard. What can we do about it? Right? So what, what did OAuth 2.1 do? So, and the other thing is, of course, yeah, um, Aaron Hammer was the only spec writer, so he could do whatever he wants. Yeah? He wrote that spec. That was his um, security vision, how it should work. But in OAuth 2, companies came in back, back. You know, like all, all of the XML web guys came back, like Microsoft and IBM and Google, and everybody thought like, oh, yeah, that's good, but it's too hard. Can we fix the signature thing? How about we uh, remove it? <laughs> okay, so basically, um, my, um, in O of 2, they removed all of the signature stuff from the spec again and came with a new idea <laughs> called bearer tokens. Okay, so what about we don't do this? Again, it's, it's a couple of years later, right? TLS is now pretty much a given, so you don't have to fight against the fact that your transport is insecure. So they said, okay, why, maybe, oh, maybe bearer tokens are good enough. Yeah? And Aaron, if you ever follow that history, he hated that. <laughs> he actually, a couple of uh, years later, he withdrew his name from the RFC document. Okay? 
So he said, no, I'm not, I'm not giving my name away for an enterprise version of OAuth where the big players simplify it up to a point where it's too dumb to be secure. Okay? He was a bit over-exaggerating maybe, <laughs> but uh, on paper, bearer tokens are less secure than signature-bound tokens. I mean, that's just the fact of life. Yeah? And he made a big thing about him leaving OAuth. He created things like this. <laughs> um, he had a really popular talk at a conference um, where he coined a new hashtag that you should use on the internet. <laughs> and, you know, ultimately, he left. Okay? So, that's that. Um, what, one last thing he did before he left, he said, okay, I demand one thing. You are going to split up the OAuth spec into two specifications. One is how to acquire a token, and one is how to use a token. Okay? And if you only know today that you're going to do bearer, then in the future, I want you to create another spec called proof of possession usage. And it never happened. <laughs> okay? So that's 2012, yeah? And that spec was never created afterwards, yeah? Um, there were some attempts to, to add proof of possession to OAuth. A um, couple of years later, there was a spec how to do a server to client key distribution. And, and that, that's the easy part, right? But the hard part is then, once you have that token, how do you bind it to the client cryptographically? And guess what? They came up with a method for signing HTTP requests. And if I would open that spec up, it would pretty much look the same as O of 1.0. Like, take the URL, take the parameters, take the body, canonicalize it, sign it, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And there were fundamental problems there. Like, you couldn't do HTTP streaming, for example, because how would you sign a stream, for example, and, and other things. Yeah? So it, it didn't happen. Okay? Uh, the only thing that, that was left was a spec that basically said, let's, let's imagine we would have proof of possession. How would the JSON web token look like? <laughs> but we, we don't have it, so I don't know. Um, but let's, let's, let's put it out there. Okay? Uh, everybody was hoping, given the fundamental problems with that, like streaming and, and other things, that maybe we could solve the problem at the transport layer. Right? That's why when they came up with another attempt a couple of years later called token binding. Does anyone remember token binding? It was basically an extension to the TLS protocol that you could basically embed uh, a, a unique TLS channel key into the token and then bind the token to the TLS channel. It worked wonderfully. It did work up until Google decided to not implement it. So then now you have to ask yourself, how useful is a web standard if the biggest browser is not going to support it? Right? So that was that. Did they actually keep a version of that in the Edge for a while, or in the, the Microsoft uh, browser? So it, it was removed from Chromium. Yeah. Right? Even that page is not online anymore. That's uh, archive.org is your friend. If you're searching for all of that, they, it, it's all gone. Basically, but basically what, what the guy says is, well, we have this token binding feature here. It, it's not getting enough traction, so I'm just going to remove it. That's it, right? Many speculations why Google did that. They never gave an official explanation. Uh, I guess they had their reasons. Performance was one of them, we heard, that the performance of, you know, like, let's say you are a, a company that, that relies on that your web, web page shows up as quickly as possible in every browser on the world like a search page, for example. <laughs> and that is now more complicated, and now it takes like a half a second longer. Eh, maybe we don't want that. Anyways, that's just pure speculation. OK? Um, good, so that was off the table as well. Huh. And now, a couple of years later, what happened is this FAP thing, right? So FAP stands for, uh, did stand for uh, financial APIs. Yeah, so the, basically the idea was, okay, now banks start using OAuth. We need something more secure than the standard OAuth. And funnily enough, right, people said, okay, in, if you want to... Um, so, so basically they, they said, like, banks must implement FAP or PSD2 by the end of, what, was it 2020 or 2019? I think it was uh, September 2019. Yes. And you weren't allowed to 
play if you didn't. So. So, so basically what they said is, and the only way to be FARP compliant is you have to use proof possession tokens, <laughs> which didn't exist. <laughs> 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 okay, so, so that, that's a slide from a guy, Ned Sakamura, you know, famous guy in the area. He says, okay, and in FARP, we're all going to move everything to proof possession. Yeah? So that's kind of like when we started thinking about the, the, the ramifications for the health industry, right? Yes. And the thing is, I mean, health is uh, you know, primarily about helping the patients, uh, but the other perspective is protecting the patients, and some of that information is quite sensitive, and it can be used in many different scenarios. I mean, uh, information about uh, mental health, for instance, could be a, a nice leverage if you're doing like negotiations about uh, fishing rights in the northern parts of Norway. I don't know, you know, you can imagine. Uh, so the thing is, if, for health, when we started working together, we, uh, we had a couple of uh, like new implementations coming. Uh, some of them were tied to prescriptions, which is by default, you know, something you'd want to protect really well. Uh, but there are other examples as well. It's like, the National Service for Registering Death. Uh, if you're able to kill someone uh, by using the API, uh, you know that would that would be bad, basically. So, yeah. And you thought bearer tokens are not good enough for that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, what do you do? Well, you have bearer tokens uh, back in the days. There weren't a lot of support for cryptography, for instance. It was difficult to do this shit in, in, in browsers, etc. So uh, instead of, you know, in, in lack of uh, good alternatives, you do other types of mitigations. You, you, you know, we, for instance, set the, the lifetime of the uh, token to like one minute, perhaps, you know, make sure that it's uh, bound to an audience, etc. It's uh, uh, right. mitigations. Miti because mitigation techniques. Yeah. In, in absence of the yeah. technology, basically. Yes. But so. you can imagine, wh whoever wrote an OAuth-based system in his life knows that a one-minute token lifetime is, is not trivial to implement, right? Especially at scale, right? When you have multiple people needing to refresh them and store them and manage them and, and so on. So yeah, so one minute is, yeah. Uh, I, I have many customers, even in the not so critical space, which have 10 minute access tokens, for example, for, the, for exactly the same reason, because they, you know, they want to mitigate the, the risk when they leak mm. somehow, yeah. especially if they install the software on untrusted networks like customer networks where they don't control, you know, they don't control reverse proxies, they don't control firewalls and they're logging and it's not end to end encrypted. It's only point to point in these networks, typically yeah. 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 mobile, mobile applications, same, same problem. Yes, so, but the interesting thing is now, um, now that the banks needed it, right? So it, you, you, you could only play the, the PSD2, uh, PSD2 game in the EU if you implemented that. But you couldn't implement it because there was no technology for that. Mm -hmm. So now the banks, you know, money actually, you know, banks equals money. The money came in and the pressure on the big vendors and on the IETF and so on. And basically, okay, they said like, okay, we need a stopgap solution now. Something that we can deploy immediately with existing technology and not invent something new, mm -hmm. right? And that's when they basically said, okay, what could we do? And that's where this um, spec came along. It's uh, basically reusing mutual TLS. Okay, so the, the assumption was that in many banks you already have PKI and TLS and smart cards and client certificates and all of that stuff does already exist, right? And we can, and you know, some, some smart people, uh, the authors here, they figured out, okay, we can use MTLS to, um, to basically provide a mechanism, yeah, as it says, to bind access tokens to a client's mutual TLS certificate and OAuth protected resources. Okay, so that was kind of like this, the solution that no one was happy with, but could be produced in a very short amount of time. Yeah? So how does mutual TLS work? Has anyone ever implemented MTLS, like for real? Right, it's complicated, right? It, it's a complicated beast. The best, um, the best uh, explainer video that I found on the internet is this one here. Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But in essence, in MTLS, you have a client certificate and you have a server certificate, right? The server certificate is to authenticate the server, and then afterwards, the client certificate is used to authenticate the client, and after successful negotiation, they have a shared secret that they can use then to encrypt and, and sign the traffic, okay? So yes, this does exist. It's proven technology. It is deployed in some spaces. Um, so yeah, so let's, let, let's see how proof possession would work with MTLS. So, you know, it's very similar, yeah? The client creates an X509 certificate and a private key, or he there is already one, like, you know, maybe even, even on some hardware device, for example, you know, there are so many options with MTLS. But the idea is this, okay, so the, the client has, a, has an X509 cert, then he opens an MTLS channel, so he does mutual authentication with the STS, he sends along the X, X509 certificate. Once that is validated, the token server uh, can uh, create a, the hash of the certificate, which is a unique identifier, and then embed the hash into the access token. Okay, so basically what that means is now that the client has proven to know the private key that belongs to the hash of the public key. Okay, and then the client just opens another channel to the API using the same X509 certificate doing MTLS, right? And then the API, has the cert from the transport channel, it has the access token with the hash, he hashes the transport channel cert, compares the hashes, if they are the same, the client has proven that he knows the secret. And if an attacker would steal the thing, he would miss the X509 certificate, which is you know, only known to the client, and then this wouldn't work, okay? Um, if you wonder how such an access token looks like, it's, um, like this, right, there's some JWT stuff, and there's a special claim that they introduced, it's called CNF, or confirmation, yeah? And the confirmation means, how, how, how can the client confirm that he knows the secret? And that means X509 thumbprint in SHA-256, okay? And that's the hash of the, the SHA-256 hash of the, of the X509 certificate. How, how many .NET developers are in the room? Okay, most of you, um, guess what? That's the only code that, that is needed to create an X509 certificate on the fly. I'm not saying it's pretty code, <laughs> but you know, it's boilerplate code, yeah? And in case you wonder what, what, what this number means, this number means client certificate. <laughs> it's an OID, right? Some people love them. <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, since we have some time, I, I, I can quickly show you that. Um, so here's a, a version of identity server that is using MTLS. And you see once, uh, if you have MTLS, uh, then in your discovery document, there, there's a new uh, uh, element here called MTLS endpoint aliases, and they point to the MTLS versions of the standard OAuth endpoints on your token server, right? So here's the, the token endpoint, revocation, introspection, and device authorization in this case. Um, so. And you see also that typically you have to have to deploy MTLS on a different domain, right? And there's all, all sorts of complexity here definitely going on at the infrastructure level. Um, and then on the client side, you first generate that certificate, right? That, that, that's the code I just showed you, yeah? That's this thing. And then you request the token. And basically all you need to do when while requesting the token, I love that projector, it's really nice, um, is to, to basically bind the client certificate to your HTTP client, right? So here, we basically create the handler, put the cert onto the transport, and then we use that HTTP client to request the token. Yeah? That, that's how you do MTLS in .NET. Um, and then, then you have the token, and then you can um, call the service, right? And when calling the service, you're doing the same thing. You are getting the client, use the same X5, X509 cert, you add the access token, and then you're calling the API, right? So if I would run that, it, it's not very exciting, like all my demos, that there's a token. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can see that that's the access token coming back from the token server, and m you might not have seen this before here, that that's the CNF claim I mentioned earlier, and that is now binding the access token to the client certificate, okay? And then on, on the API side, of course, you need to validate this, 
And in, in .NET world, you would probably have a middleware running after the authentication that looks at the third, looks at the token, compares the two values, and only if they match, the call gets through. Okay? So, um, that's MTLS. Um, as I said, it, uh, if your company is already having a working MTLS infrastructure, it's pretty easy to pull off because they already know how that works, right? You have your PKI and, and all of that, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that especially banks did like is that, that, that this is not some new hipster stuff, yeah? It's like MTLS and PKI, right? I mean, that these, these are the things we do for 20 years now and they work, yeah? Um, and yeah, and I mean, I, I give them that. It's cr quite nice that there's a wider range of special hardware out there to support this, like smart cards and uh, uh, um, HSMs and you know all of that specialized hardware. The cons are exactly the opposite of that, right? <laughs> if you don't have that up and running, it's really hard to get it up and running. The learning curve is quite steep, yeah? Again, PKI and so on. And especially for scenarios where you want to secure mobile applications, right? Where the, the mobile application is somewhere on the internet and you want to guarantee that from that somewhere place, you open an MTLS channel to your uh, company's server, good luck, <laughs> okay? Um, oh yeah, and actually, you know, like for the for the, the spa people out there, this doesn't work in browsers at all, right? So it, it would not help in any way for that kind of scenario. So, what's the alternative? Uh, there's a new spec. Yeah, it's uh, basically um, in, instead of trying to do this at the transport level, it's trying to do it at the application level meaning you don't need the MTLS, PKI, blah, 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 blah stuff uh, up and running, okay? It's called DPOP. It is in the last draft, so the final call, as they call it, in, in the ITF, so it's going to be released very soon. And, um, yeah, so, you know, b before I hand over to Steiner to show you all the nitty-gritty details, um, guess what? <laughs> I mean, for, for most parts of my career, I... I, I I got away with just three icons for my PowerPoint slides. Yeah. <laughs> the client, the token server, and the API, right? Um, but, you know, same idea, right? The client generates a key, um, and, the, and then it signs something special called the proof token, and we'll show you how that proof token works um, in a second. And then, you know, you do a token request, send the proof token along, and the STS replies with an access token. And um, the proof token is signed, so they put the hash of the public key into the access token, okay? Same idea, just that you don't have to use X509 certificates, really, yeah? And then when you call the API, you are sending along the access token, create a new proof token using the same key pair, and again, the API has both artifacts now, and they compare the hashes, and if they match, you know, uh, that, that's good. So Steiner, how does that work? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, just, to, to say it, this is a really, you know, big thing. We're <laughs> really looking forward to, to starting using this. And, and the thing is, uh, Dominic was talking about was that uh, when Mutual TLS arrived, everyone was, you know, whoa, we finally got the, what we call sender constraining of tokens in place. We can start using it. And uh, their first experiences was with the dialogue, the selection dialogues the user had to... In browsers. In browsers. Terrible, terrible. And the ITF guys said, whoa, we can't use it. And that's why they came up with the DPOP spec. So it's designed to be simple, but of course it's, you know, to a certain degree, uh, nothing is simple in this world. Uh, but uh, the thing is that it's, um, it, it lets us, so I, I think the, the, the uh, term uh, sender constraining is uh, the best sort of description you can use you're, you're, you're uh, still achieving the same thing as you did with a mutual TLS. You're, you're constraining the token to one client. So, okay. So, this is uh, a request. That, uh, that's a pretty much st a standard OAuth token request, yeah? Yeah. With uh, one added artifact here. And that's this one. Is it the... the, the no, I, I don't have them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. I can point instead. Okay, so this is, a, this is one new thing. So uh, it's a new HTTP header where you put the DPOP proof. So remember, you, you, uh, you let the client uh, generate the DPOP proof, 
uh, and uh, you put it in the, not the authorization header, but the depop header. It's a new thing. Uh, and here you see the example of a, a depop proof. Uh, there are some new uh, claims here. Um, make special note of these two. The HTM uh, states the method that this token uh, will be used for. So you can say post or, you know, put or whatever. And the HTU is the URL that the token uh, will be valid for. So all these are things that sort of narrow the scope, of course. In addition, you have the JTI, which you will use to uh, make sure that the depop proof uh, isn't uh, used several times. So, so a JTI is basically stands for Chot ID, and it's a random number, yeah. right? It's, it's basically used for replay attacks. So that a server should not accept the same JTI in a given time window. Exactly. So uh, this portion is also quite interesting. This is where you have the public key. It's a JWK format. And uh, this is what the authorization server will use when it uh, does its cal calculations on uh, its side. Yeah, public key, unique ID, HTTP method, and HTTP URL. So all of these are registered in the IANA. So it's, uh, uh, now, and uh, you know, and, and the idea is that that J JWK is the public key of the key pair that the client generated, mm. and the signature on the proof token proves that the client knows the private key. Yeah, right. Next one. Yeah. So here you get uh, uh, an example of uh, what it looks like when it's uh, generated. This. The C this CNF claim uh, contains the JKT, it's <laughs> difficult to pronounce, and it's a hash of the thumbprint. Uh, I, I love this, and it's the base64 URL encoding yes. of the JWK SHA-256 thumbprint of the public key. Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> I, I, you yeah, know, I mean, it's, it's obvious. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I talked to, to Dominic, and I was afraid because my, my uh, you know, you have to have a very highly exercised tongue to be able to pronounce it like Dominic did, so I can't, <laughs> yeah. All right, so this is basically the same as, uh, you know, the same claim as we had in Mutual TLS. So it's, uh, it, it, already, it already exists there. Uh, it's not, it's not hard, you know. I mean, it's it's a simple addition. Um, so I guess we can perhaps go to the next one, yeah. And then, when the client calls the API, you will do the regular stuff. You will have an authorization. Well, actually, not not no. exactly the regular one because remember that always said bearer in OAuth. It, it's a it new token type now. It's a depop token. Yes, and, and, what, and what that means is it's an access token bound to a proof token. Yeah, and it's, it's of course it's bound both ways. So the depop token is or the depop proof is bound to the access token, and the access token is bound to the depop proof. Right. So w when the client now makes an API call, he needs to generate a proof token every single time for every call. I mean, keep that in mind, right? It, it's, it's not coming for free, um, but this proof token. Basically, looks pretty much the same, mm -hmm. right? But as Steiner just said, yeah, the access token contains the hash mm -hmm. of the public key, which is binding the access token to the proof token, and the proof token contains the hash of the access token. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's bound in both directions. And now you see you have the HTU, which is also kind of interesting. When you do the first depop uh, proof, it's it points to the token endpoint. While well, this one points to the API endpoint. So uh, it's, uh, I mean, this looks familiar, I guess. Nos nothing nothing uh, too weird about it. So a couple of comments here, I think, yeah, is first of all, you know, like the reason why many of these earlier specs failed was because they were so complicated, right? Because you had to sign the complete HTTP request and the body and the parameters and, you know, and so on. So here they deliberately only sign a subset of the, of the HTTP request, mm -hmm. okay? To, to not make it overly complicated. They're not signing the body, for example, right? And, and we have security people in the room. Is that a problem? <laughs> so in theory, right, you could, you could say, huh, um, I, I could exchange the body with the same post request to the same API endpoint and the proof token would still be valid, mm -hmm. right? Why doesn't that work? 
Well, it's uh, bound to, to it. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, what I mean here is that's where the JTI comes in. Right. Also, oh, yeah, the API yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. needs to make sure that he will never see the same JTI twice. Hmm. Yeah. So replay detection, it, it must be done. <laughs> okay. And how how long should your replay detection cache be? What do you think? How how many hours or days of JTIs do you need to check? <laughs> Pun? Well, there, there there is no expiration time, right? It only has the IAT claim, the issued ad claim, which tells them when was the token created. And now every API can create their own policy in saying, I'm only accepting tokens which are not older than a minute, for example, right? And for that minute, you're keeping your JTI cache so that you can make sure that you don't see replayed proof tokens. So just a, 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 actually a, uh, another piece of uh, information, which is kind of uh, interesting, is that Microsoft actually has been using Depop for a while in their products, like Azure. Uh, yeah, you know, thing. Microsoft is the company that likes to take uh, pre-release specs, yeah, <laughs> changes them a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> and and uses them in their products. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but that's, that's also an interesting thing is that they actually discovered some misusage of this pattern the, or this mechanism. So uh, they had to do some extensions based on their uh, experiences. And, uh, you know, so now they've, they've sort of uh, filled, the, filled the gaps with, uh, with right. in the spec. So yeah, so I mean, again, this here assumes you're using TLS. So, so the transport is secure already, right? It, it, it says you must sign the HTTP method and you must sign the HTTP URL, but the spec also says you can sign more parts of the HTTP request if you want to, right? But then you're now getting again into the whole discussion of does the HTTP request on the client side look the same as on the receiving end mm -hmm. if, there, if there is a reverse proxy who shuffles around the query string parameters and, you know, you can do it, you can make it more complicated, but the consensus is, is that this is signing enough. Yeah, and we're happy about it because at a certain point it looked like they were going to add a lot of stuff to it, but they managed to keep it simple enough, I think. Yep. So the point is, uh, what's the next slide here? Yeah, just a small point. Sure. Using this, the APIs have to implement uh, the replay. For proof, to to for, for proof tokens, not, not, not for yeah, access yeah, tokens. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm. And that's a big point because you have to implement it. You oh, yeah, have you have to. to you have to implement it, yeah. It's a new thing you have to take into consideration. You have to at least have a policy for um, the freshness, like w what's the oldest issued ad you would ex accept, mm. right? Um, yeah, so um, quick. Quick thing, um, you know, these days I'm, I'm not writing that much code anymore. <laughs> um, but between Christmas and, uh, and New Year's Eve, uh, I found some time to, do, <laughs> to prototype this. Yeah? Um, the client side, at least. So, um, so basically, the way in, in .NET, you, the easiest way in .NET I found to retrofit this to an existing system is, uh, you know what, a, what an... Um, HTTP message handler is in .NET. The, um, .NET uh, the, the, the HTTP client has an extensibility infrastructure called an HTTP message handler. And you know, the, the, the idea is this. Yeah, here, the client creates the key pair. Okay? It, it, in this case, an RSA key. It could be a, an, an, an elliptic curve. By the way, these are the only ones you are, you are allowed to use. Symmetric keys are forbidden, which mm. is good. Yeah? Um, and then you're basically just putting that key pair into your HTTP message handler and then you're using the message handler to make your outbound HTTP request. And then this will basically, for every outgoing request, it will create the proof token and send it along to the recipient, okay? Um, and then on the receiving end, so to speak, right? Uh, so imagine starting here is the API, right? On, on, on the receiving end, you would extract the proof token from the incoming request by extracting the header called dpop, yeah? And then you know I'm getting called via get, and this is my URL, and that's the access token that came along, 
right? And now you would validate all these things together, and only if that returns true, so to speak, <laughs> it's a valid request. So you would have to calculate, right? Calculate the... That's what the library would do. Yeah. Exactly. So, so um, you, you, you need to change your code to implement that, that technique, right? But I think this is a, uh, an, an okay way to do it because the impact is not that big, right? The only impact you have or have to think about is uh, what's the lifetime of your key material? Do you want to, you know, like, what's your notion of a session, so to speak, I guess? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what's the summary? What do you think? Well, <laughs> I, I, I said I haven't programmed for a long time, but I actually did a, a JavaScript implementation of uh, Depop a while ago, and I was able to do it, which kind of says something because, um, yeah. So I think it's, you know, it's, uh, it's the way to do it for browser-based client, clients. I think it's a very good uh, solution for like native apps or desktop style apps as well. But of course, it's, it's more complicated. It's, it's, you know, you, you need to handle your keys, you need to, to, to do stuff in a safe way. Uh, but the, you know, the, the big, big benefit of this is you don't need the infrastructure. You don't need to have all the setup uh, and the, you know, the, the, the regular things that comes with the initial TLS. The only downside is that right now there, there is no commercial product that exists that implements it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the nature of the spec, you know, not being finalized. Uh, uh, we are working on it and we're going to release it, you know, mid next year, I guess. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's new technology, right? Um, it's, it's been out there for a while and a couple of companies have implemented like private implementations like Microsoft and some others, so it works, right? But it's, it's you know, you couldn't use it today, right? So you, you couldn't walk out of the room and say like, okay, I'm gonna use Depop because you won't find the implementation of it, at least in .NET, okay? That uh, maybe in, in, in other places they, they do that, right? So I, I can add actually a, a Oh, and, and the last thing, oh. because you mentioned browsers, yeah. Don't think Depop will secure your JavaScript, yeah? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Depop, and they specifically say that right at the beginning of the spec, it's not a mitigation technique for cross-site scripting, right? And I'm doing, Philip's doing a talk tomorrow morning, and I'm doing a talk afterwards about the backend for front-end pattern and all of the things that people can do in the browser. You should come there if you're interested in why this is not the solution to that. Yeah. So uh, just a, a quick side note here as well. So we work for the, these are my colleagues here. We work for the, for the Norwegian Health Network as consultants and we are actually uh, mandating the FAPI 2.0 uh, as technical uh, security profile for uh, using uh, OpenID Connect and OAuth. And we don't have support for uh, sender constraining. We do actually uh, because we use Dominic's uh, product, but it's, uh, so we do have mutual TLS, but it's very, very difficult to, to, to do. So we do require it, but we <laughs> can't support it as of now. <laughs> it will take a while, but uh, it's, it's good intentions. I think that's the most important thing. Okay, so I guess um, my, my final words here are, you know, bearer tokens, as we now know, have certain security properties, right? Um, I mean, the sky hasn't fallen yet, yeah, because of bearer tokens. Yeah, so it, I mean, everybody's using them. <laughs> yeah, um, it's not that, you know, there, there are risks that you can mitigate with things like token lifetimes and, and other stuff, yeah. But uh, I, I'm not saying every single application out there now needs approved possession tokens, okay? The, it doesn't come for free. That's my main point, yeah? It, it's not that you just flip a switch and suddenly everything is, uh, is even more secure. Yeah, you've seen that you have the choice between MTLS, which has complexity at the uh, transport layer. You have the choice of Depop, which has complexity at the application layer. Uh, and you, you need to make up your mind. I, I, I guess at the end of the day, as security guys always like to say, it's a matter of your threat model. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Any questions? Uh, so we have a question there. Nope. 
Nope. Nope. No, no, no. Please, please go to this gentleman's talk tomorrow morning, <laughs> and he'll tell you exactly why in in, yeah. in, a, in a sixty minute format. <laughs> yeah, this doesn't change anything. The browser is still. No, 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 no. It's a structural problem that you can't solve in the browser, basically. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but then now again. As to XSS. Well, if you're doing a browser-based app, you're fucked anyway. Off the record. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that would not solve the, co the, the code injection problem. If the browser would do it for you, then the attacker injecting the code into your application can do it as well. I'm not seeing the, the, the point, to be honest. Yeah, it's, 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 as I said, the, uh, there were revisions of the spec where they thought they could solve the problem. Then they got told better partly by Philip, <laughs> and now the spec says very clearly this is not um, 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 a countermeasure for cross-site scripting. If you have cross-site scripting attacks, Depop will not solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I have a question. You mentioned that you have to watch out for TDIs and replay protection. How does that correspond to TWDs are self-contained and APIs that might be load balanced, duplicated? Microservices and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's and you personal advice on managing TPS? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends, right? Uh, it, replay maintaining replay caches at scale is hard, right? Um, there are some products on the server side that make it easier, but ultimately you will always have a little latency between the moment you're storing the GTI and the moment it will be available for someone else to check. Right, so again, it, it probably must. It, so, but on top of that, you have issued add times, and off, off top of that, you had TLS. You know, so these three things together kind of give you a, a much better place. But yeah, re replay caching at cloud scale is hard. Maybe right. Maybe a follow-up question: Would, would it make sense to check depot on the gateway level instead of as every service individually? You can, but. For the same argument as people say, let's let's check the access token to the gateway level. Yeah, you can do it. There are pros and cons for that, I think, uh, but that would not um, solve the the distributed caching problem. Yeah. Uh, just a practical question: the deeper proof it has an issue that. Why does it not have the Because it's up to the uh, to the receiver to decide on their own. Be be because you, you, you might have different requirements. Um, they, they didn't want to do uh, so they didn't want to make it prescriptive, right? Because now, if they would have an expiration date, then the token server would decide about the policy of the API, right? What's the point? Yeah, so it, in, that's why they said, okay, let's only put the creation date in there, and the receiver decides what, what, what's a good creation date and what's a bad one. Mm. Yeah. Besides in banking and uh, the whole sector, do you, do you use some examples where you personally would like to see? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. In the Azure portal. <laughs> in the yeah. Azure portal, for example. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're still you know, storing access tokens in the browser, and it's kind of sensitive data as well, right? If somebody can control yourself. I mean, that, you know, I mean, in, so the browser-based applications are not really a good example because they, they are all insecure mm. at some point. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, everywhere where it's about a lot of money, <laughs> right, or uh, sensitive data like health, health, PII, mm. you know, but um, so the, I guess the, the trade-off here is, right, um, I see Depop especially important for public clients, 
You know, like, uh, like let's say your mobile application running on your phone, right? Where you are using an untrusted network to call an API. E everywhere between your phone and, and the API, somebody could today intercept bearer tokens potentially, right? Depop would help tremendously with that mm -hmm. because the, 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 the mobile app would generate a key pair, only they know the key pair, right? Would get the token, do the Depop thing, would be much more secure, right? For server-to-server -server communication, you know, I mean, th that's already happening in a data center. So you can layer Depop on top of that to get even more security, and, and some regulations require it, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, the sweet spot for Depop, to be honest, is, is uh, native mobile applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, yes, um, we didn't mention that because oh. we didn't want to make it too complicated. Mm -hmm. But um, at the same time, the refresh tokens are getting bound to the Depop proof as well. Mm. So you basically, you have to show this. Uh, when you're refreshing the token, you have to show again that you know the private key that was used in the initial token request before you can get the, the refresh token for public clients, at least. Yeah. Please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, more uh, comments, not a question. Uh, it's more. Um, as a large scale war provider, our main mitigation for not having proof of possession is uh, short lived tokens. Uh, the price of uh, what we have, the uh, effect of having short lived tokens, it's a lot of complexity in the ecosystem using our uh, service. So, Introducing this will uh, the security part is one bit, but uh, it's also taking down the complexity, the overall complexity, you know, of all the clients, all the APIs. Uh, a lot. But and, uh, you're getting new complexity uh, somewhere else. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Oh, question. Yeah, that's a good question, yeah. So uh, that, that goes back to my point of saying, like, if it's a server-to-server -server communication already, which would be the BFF, right, and they're happening in the same data center, and, you know, then maybe I, maybe I wouldn't do it, unless you live in a space where it's regulated. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's, I mean, I'm, 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 a lot of those types of decisions need to be based on risk assessment. Yeah, but that, but, but may, maybe I'm wrong, and I just uh, realized it's recorded, yeah, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, uh, it's a threat modeling thing, to be honest, and that's yeah. not even a joke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, then, thanks for your time. See you around. Yeah. Oh, pl please.